we all know East Asia was once largely colonized and that they became independent. But most people don't know how this happened or even why it happened. So in this video, I seek to change that. In this video, we will talk about how every single colony in East Asia gained their independence in the 20th century. We will look at the general trends at the time, the struggles faced by the natives, and why almost every country with colonies decided to decolonize. This video is the third in a series on decolonization. We will eventually cover every part of the world. But before we can talk about how East Asia was decolonized, we need to look at how it was colonized. And for this, we need to start with Portugal. In the late 15th century, they established trade missions to Asia, then set up forts along the coastlines, and eventually conquered the lands around them to be turned into proper colonies as we think of today. This was the model most colonizers used in East Asia. And soon after the Portuguese came the Spanish, establishing their own network of colonies. Of course, the other European powers wanted some of the lucrative trade as well, and in the 17th century the Dutch established the Dutch East India Company to enter the trade, followed soon by the British and their East India Company. And if the British did something, the French had to do it too, so then France created colonies in Indochina in the 19th century. When Germany unified into a single country, they also wanted colonies, saying that they didn't want to put other nations in the shade, but also wanted their place under the sun. And so they colonized various parts around East Asia. Japan before 1853 was a country which had isolated itself from the rest of the world. But in that year, the USA demanded that Japan open its markets to US trade. Soon, other countries wanted the same deal with the island nation. The Japanese realized that this was likely the beginning of their own colonization, like what was happening all around them at the time and so they decided to industrialize so that they would be too powerful for Europeans to control. As a result of this, Japan colonized various regions throughout East Asia for the resources it didn't have itself. But the first to decolonize in East Asia, however, was Spain. By the late 19th century, the Philippines was the last Spanish colony in this part of the world. In 1898, they lost a war against the USA and handed this territory over to them. As a result, the USA became a colonial power in East Asia while Spain stopped being one. Germany also lost its colonies in a war. After their defeat in World War I, all German colonies were taken over by other powers. In East Asia, this meant that what we now call Papua New Guinea was taken over by Australia and its colonies in China was taken over by the Japanese. Another latecomer to colonization was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They held a single colony in East Asia a small part of the city of Tianjin, about 0.6 square kilometers. This was meant as a small outpost from which the Austro-Hungarian Empire could trade with the rest of China on their own terms. During World War I, China joined the war against Germany and Austria-Hungary, retook this piece of territory, and after the war made a treaty with both Austria and Hungary where each renounced their rights to this piece of land. But the Europeans simply decided in 1928 that this land would be handed over to Italy instead, and China at the time could do very little about it. Japan and Italy were allies at first. However, in 1943, Italy switched sides and Japan moved in to occupy this territory. When Japan lost the war, this territory was then handed over to the Republic of China, who lost it in a civil war to what we now call the People's Republic of China. And so ended both the Italian and Austro-Hungarian colonial presence in East Asia. And so we get to Japan. It controlled territories all over East Asia, from Taiwan to Korea to mainland China. But then, everything changed when Japan attacked in World War II. Japan invaded more of China and took over the colonies of France, the UK and the Netherlands. But in the end, Japan's economy was outproduced by its enemies. Being attacked from nearly all sides, dwindling resources and nukes dropping, Japan surrendered. And with this surrender, they lost nearly all their colonies. The first of their colonies to be decolonized were Manchuria and Mengjiang. These were some of the largest of their colonies, which they conquered in 1932. 
But as Japan was about to lose the war, the Soviet Union invaded it to take control over these territories. They were not interested in ruling China, however, and handed the land over to the communist faction fighting for control over China, the People's Liberation Army. The Soviets officially withdrew from this region on May 3rd, 1946. The Soviets also invaded Korea, another one of Japan's colonies. However, here the USA was afraid that the USSR would turn Korea into a puppet state. And so the two countries decided that the Korean colony should be split up into two occupation zones, one controlled by the Soviet Union and one controlled by the USA. They eventually became the modern North Korea and South Korea. The Soviets left the North in 1946 and the USA decolonized the South in 1948. If you want to know what happened to the Koreas after that, you can watch my video on Korean history. The next regions to decolonize were the Wang Jingwei regime and Taiwan. When Japan surrendered, these territories were simply handed over to the Republic of China. A rather unknown colony was South Shekalin, an island off the coast of East Asia. It was first colonized by the Japanese in the 17th century, but shortly after, Russia took interest in it as well. In 1855, they decided to share the island between them, and the two sides would occasionally fight for control, until in the Second World War, the Soviet Union conquered it, and to this day, this island is in the hands of Russia. And the last Japanese colony was the Ryukyu Kingdom. In 1609, it became a puppet state of Japan, and in 1879, the island chain was officially colonized. They did not become independent, and today are an integrated part of Japan known as the Okinawa Prefecture. But World War II wasn't just important for the Japanese colonies. You see, Japan had taken over various European colonies. French Indochina, Dutch Indonesia, British Burma, US Philippines. For a few short years, there was barely a Western presence in Southeast Asia. But the Japanese were divided on what exactly to do with these new Asian territories. Some wanted to give them their independence. Others believed that Japan should turn them into puppet states, while others thought that they should rule over them out of the belief that Japan was the superior nation in East Asia. But Japan was too busy fighting World War II to come to a definitive decision on what to do with these Western colonies they now owned. As a result, there were different approaches to the native people in different parts of Asia. In some places, the locals were granted political powers, while in other places, Japan took over the role of the Europeans. And during the war, many, many of these colonies were never retaken, meaning that up until the moment of Japan's surrender, most of the European colonies in East Asia remained under Japanese control. And as a result, the Japanese spent years destroying the European colonial systems. For example, in Indonesia, the Japanese put all the Dutch bureaucrats into prison. This meant that they had a shortage. And so they decided to let local Indonesians hold important government positions. In Indochina, various militias sprung up to fight the Japanese, gaining years of combat experience under Japanese occupation. And in Burma, they set up a puppet government able to appeal to the local population. And then, suddenly, Japan surrendered. In many places, the Japanese troops were never driven off, meaning that suddenly, the Japanese soldiers stationed across East Asia were informed that they had lost the war, had to hand over the colonies back to European powers, and that they had to go back home. But there was a problem. Those European powers just got out of a world war on their own continent, and many simply didn't have the soldiers, ships, and weapons to re-establish control. And so, for a few months, the colonies had a power vacuum. The Japanese were technically not allowed to rule, but the Europeans were effectively not able to rule. And in those power vacuums, the idea of independence blossomed. Because most East Asians didn't want the Europeans to return at all, seeing their rule as just another form of oppression. The reason behind this is the way Europeans ruled the colonies. European nations often justified colonization with the argument that Europeans were technologically more advanced and therefore had to be superior in every other way as well. Arguing that if European culture, genetics and people weren't superior, 
then Europeans wouldn't be able to conquer so much of the world. And as the superior people, it was their duty to bring this excellence to the rest of the world, so that others may also enjoy the greatness that is Europe. An idea not backed up by any science, but rather a useful tool for colonizers to justify their oppression of faraway peoples. And when Europeans went to those other nations, they rarely brought improvements in living conditions, and instead often created a racist system in which non-Europeans would be exploited. Infrastructure was only created to bring goods to Europeans. Industries were only created to produce wealth that could be sent back to the homeland. And education was only provided to those whom were deemed useful to the colonizers, with human rights violations being commonplace. And so now it's 1945. Japan just surrendered and the Europeans will take weeks or even months before they can retake power. The first European colonies we will look at are the Dutch colonies. And for this, I need to give a disclaimer. I am Dutch. What we will be discussing here is a very sensitive part of my country's history. In fact, a new report came out on the topic of decolonization in Indonesia while writing this video. I promise I will try my best to remain impartial during this section and only give facts. However, if you think I am unfair, I won't remove your comments criticizing me. I might even pin it if your critique is really good. At first, the Netherlands was unable to retake control over Indonesia on their own. So they asked the United Kingdom for help, asking them to transport Dutch troops and bureaucrats to their colony and send British troops to a few vital locations for a couple of months while the Netherlands would rebuild and set up its own colonial infrastructure once again. But Indonesia had its own functional government. When Japan took over, they put all the Dutch people in camps. These people were essential in running the colony. Japan was unwilling to send a lot of bureaucrats themselves, as they had other parts of the empire they wanted to focus on. So the Japanese occupying Indonesia decided to hire or promote Indonesians to important positions of power. And those Indonesians were allowed to open dialogue with the local Indonesian population, something which the Dutch had banned during its rule. And when Japan surrendered, they gave up their positions of power, but the Indonesians were still in the government. And so just two days after the Japanese surrender, on August 17, 1945, Indonesian nationalists took over the Indonesian government and wrote the shortest declaration of independence I have ever read. We, the people of Indonesia, hereby declare the independence of Indonesia. Matters concerning the transfer of power and other matters will be executed in an orderly manner and in the shortest possible time. When the British finally arrived on September 29th, they found a Republic of Indonesia which had asserted its jurisdiction over the region. It had created functional administrative centers in Java, Sumatra and Madura. But the British were not particularly interested in taking over Indonesia just so they could hand it over to the Dutch. The British Empire itself was falling apart in India, while back in Europe they were afraid of a food shortage. Indonesia grew all sorts of crops which would help reduce this upcoming shortage. And so the British simply decided to leave the native government in place while sending Dutch troops and bureaucrats so the Dutch could re-establish control in eastern Indonesia themselves. But this was a clear sign to the Indonesian government that the British intended to help the Dutch restore their overlordship over them, resulting in the Battle of Surabaya between Great Britain and Indonesia, where tens of thousands died fighting for their independence. This battle galvanized the people as a heroic symbol in their fight for freedom. While the British did manage to win the battle, they lost hundreds of soldiers and had to rely on tanks, aircraft and warships all of which were expensive, and the British had other things they wanted to spend their money on. So they had a simple choice, fight for the Dutch to help secure their hold of the colony, possibly losing a valuable food supply at a time when food was scarce. Or they could tell the Dutch to start negotiating with Indonesia like the British were doing in India. The British chose the second option and basically just wanted to get out of this whole situation at this point. And so the Dutch, weakened from five years of occupation during World War II, decided to talk. They promised that Indonesia's government would be allowed to hold on to power as part of a future Dutch Commonwealth. 
They were trying to make it seem like the relationship would be similar to that between Australia and the United Kingdom, for example. Being part of the British Commonwealth, but without the British telling them what to do. But in actuality, the Dutch were unwilling to change their relationship with the Indonesians. To the Dutch government, Indonesia was an important source of income. They needed that money to rebuild their homeland. And these promises were a way to placate the Indonesians and to give themselves time to take over Indonesia again. By 1946, the two sides agreed that the Republic of Indonesia would have authority over Java, Sumatra and Madura and that they would cooperate to create a federal Indonesia within a Netherlands-Indonesian Union. This sounded like the Dutch were willing to hand over control. However, the actual plan was to create an Indonesia consisting of several states. The Dutch would then make sure that they directly or indirectly controlled a majority of these states. And whenever a decision had to be made, it would always be the Dutch who got to make the decision. And while they were negotiating, the Dutch were also moving more and more troops to Indonesia. Unhappy with the speed at which they were taking control, the Dutch government implemented the first police action in 1947. They captured Indonesian leaders, set fire to entire towns, would take people from their homes in the middle of the night. Up to 100,000 Indonesians died during their struggle for independence. In the rare cases where such crimes against humanity were prosecuted, the Dutch judges rarely gave the Dutch soldiers a guilty verdict. In many ways, the Dutch were doing to the Indonesians what the Germans had done to the Dutch during World War II. For decades, the Dutch government has denied that violence was systematic and constant. However, a report came out in February 2022 which showed that nearly all levels of government were fully aware of what was happening but chose to do nothing against the crimes against humanity. According to the report, the Dutch government was too detached from Asia to particularly care about the plight of their colonial subjects. They believed that it was simply impossible for Indonesians to ever organize themselves into a government, despite having formed a government right after Japan's surrender, and that they instead believed that Indonesians needed superior Dutch people to organize their society for them so that the local population may benefit from the Dutch superiority. In 2022, the Dutch king made an apology for the level of violence used in the war. In line with earlier statements by my government, I would like, I would like to express my, and repeat regret and ap ap apologies for the excessive violence on the part of the Dutch in those years. I would like to remind everyone that this dude was trained from birth to be a public speaker. The Indonesians were poorly armed, with many having to fight with bamboo spears, while the Dutch army used tanks, warships and aircraft. By 1948, the Dutch had essentially won the war and taken control of Indonesia. Yet, the native population resisted the reoccupation and fought a guerrilla war. A second police action was implemented. However, if brutality doesn't work, using more brutality won't work either. Instead, Pictures, videos and stories were shared around the world showing exactly what the Dutch were doing in Indonesia. As a result, international opinion turned against the Netherlands. In particular, Australia and the newly independent India put diplomatic pressure on the Dutch to stop fighting. And the Netherlands agreed in December 1948. Now that violence was impossible, negotiations continued. And a year later, on December 27th, 1949, the Dutch officially handed over sovereignty to the Indonesian government. With the exception of Dutch West Papua. It was originally meant to join Indonesia, however the Dutch wanted to create a country in East Asia where people with European or European and Asian ancestors could move to after Indonesian independence. But Indonesia wanted this region to become theirs as well. And so the two sides decided to negotiate. Indonesia in the early 1950s was a federation of states, similar to the USA or Germany. And the Dutch government thought that they could control West Papua through this population with European ancestry. 
So then, when it joined as a state in Indonesia, the Netherlands would once again have direct influence in their former colony. Essentially, they were still trying to turn Indonesia into a puppet state of the Netherlands. And as you can imagine, Indonesia wasn't very happy with the idea of their former colonizer coming back a second time to take over again. Not even indirectly. So, Indonesia decided to stop being a federation and become a republic instead in the 1950s, with a far more centralized government with far less European influence. This way, the Dutch plan of controlling a majority of the states in order to control the central government had been thwarted. Unsure what to do, the Dutch decided to stall the negotiations now that they couldn't use it to control their former colony anymore. Indonesia wasn't happy with this and in retaliation they sent troops to occupy West Papua and took over the Dutch companies in Indonesia who controlled important parts of their economy. The Indonesians wanted to make sure that the Netherlands couldn't use their control over the economy against Indonesia. So in essence, the government was seizing the means of production. And all of a sudden, the USA took notice. Because that sounded an awful lot like Soviet-style communism. Indonesia controlled important resources and shipping lanes, and the USA didn't want to risk them becoming an ally of the Soviet Union. And they saw that the Dutch were pushing Indonesia to take these actions. And so the USA used their influence in the Netherlands to force a compromise. Indonesia would temporarily rule West Papua from 1962 onward, with a referendum held in 1969 where the West Papuans could decide to become independent or remain with Indonesia. This referendum was eventually held by going to the elites, tribal elders and local kings and asking how their people felt. In the end, the referendum came out in favor of joining Indonesia, which immediately sparked an independence movement. Whether you consider this a decolonization or merely a new colonization by Indonesia, I'll leave that up to the West Papuans watching this video. Next up is the French colony of Indochina. The French faced many of the same issues as the Netherlands. Just like the Dutch, they were unable to immediately take over their colony after six years of war and occupation. But the French faced an additional problem. The people of Indochina had fought the Japanese for five years. When Japan surrendered, they kind of just let these groups take over parts of Indochina. After all, Japan had already lost. Why should they keep the peace in Indochina just to hand it over to the French? On September 2nd, 1945, Vietnam declared its independence. The French have fled. The Japanese have capitulated. The Emperor has abdicated. Our people have broken the chains which for nearly a century have fettered them and have won independence for the fatherland. Laos had already declared its independence in April, during the Japanese occupation. And just like the Dutch, France was unwilling to give up their colonies. They were afraid that if Indochina became independent, that other parts of the French Empire might declare their independence too. Which turned out to be true, as it helped inspire the French colonies in Africa to demand their own independence in the 1950s and 60s. When France returned, they were met with a hostile Indochina. Now that Japan was gone, the various militias, rebel groups and independence movements turned their efforts towards the French. The British urged the French to negotiate with these nationalist movements, similar to how the British were negotiating with nationalist movements in India. And the nationalists were actually willing to remain part of the French Empire as an autonomous region, where the Indo-Chinese would rule Indochina as part of the French Empire. But France refused and sent in the army. By April 1946, France had retaken control over most of Indochina. However, the locals kept resisting their French overlords. Their control was weakest in North Vietnam. And here, the nationalist leaders tried finding allies abroad. But they only managed to find a single one. China. China wanted an independent Vietnam in order to remove French influence in East Asia. But France instead offered to negotiate with China. 
and the two sides agreed that China would stop supporting the North Vietnamese and France would relinquish any claims to parts of China that it used to control before World War II. With Chinese support gone, the North Vietnamese looked for other allies. But unlike Indonesia, they found none. In the struggle for independence, France shelled the city of Haiphong in November 1946, murdering about 6,000 people. December that same year, the First Indochina War started. It was first a small conflict, however, in 1949 it turned into an all-out war, with various major powers supporting either side, such as the Soviet Union and China supporting the North Vietnamese, and the US supporting France. But in the end, the French lost. A peace treaty was agreed to at the 1954 Geneva Conference, and Vietnam would be split into two countries, North Vietnam and South Vietnam. This split would result in the Vietnam War half a year later. On November 9, 1953, Cambodia declared its independence, although it would continue fighting the French until 1954 as well. Laos gained their independence during the war by first becoming a puppet government of the French ruled by Laos royalty, but as the war turned against France, they eventually gave more and more autonomy to the Laos government in the hopes that they wouldn't join the fight against France. But by 1953, France had to hand over all government control to Laos, which officially became independent on December 2nd, 1953. Although it too would only be officially recognized after the Geneva Conference in 1954. Next up are the British colonies. The first British colony in East Asia to decolonize was Burma. When Japan occupied Burma, it put a native Burmese government in place to help them keep control. But this also meant that when the British returned, there was already a functional Burmese government there to rule itself. When the war was over, the leader of Burma under Japanese occupation formed a political alliance between various parties called the Anti-Fascist People's Freedom League. They wanted to force the British to leave their homeland peacefully, looking to places like India for inspiration. They riled up the people for the cause of independence, and in 1946, the Burmese went on strike for more political freedoms. The British gave in and allowed the majority of the ruling Council of Burma to be made up of native Burmese people. This showed to the natives that with just a little bit of protesting, they could demand a lot from the British. This caused more and more people to call for independence. The British were already dealing with an independence movement in their Indian colony and simply couldn't hold on to Burma. And so, in 1947, they promised independence, signed a treaty for the transfer of power, and on January 4th, 1948, Burma became an independent country, although today the country is called Myanmar. The next colony we will talk about is Malaya. In the 1920s and 30s, the peasants organized to create nationalist movements. When Japan took over, these nationalist movements radicalized, armed themselves and fought against the Japanese. When the war was over, they switched from fighting the Japanese to fighting the British. Some were fighting for independence. Some wanted to create a state where ethnically Malay people ran the government, while others wanted to create a more equal communist society. These communists assassinated various landowners and launched guerrilla operations in order to force the British to leave. But instead, the British declared a state of emergency and spent from 1948 to 1960 fighting these guerrilla forces. And while the British won, they did placate the local Malaya people. In 1949, they promised independence. Between 1952 and 55, they held local and state elections to create a functioning Malaya government. And in 1957, they elected their first Prime Minister, officially becoming independent on August 31st, 1957. This was soon followed by Singapore, which was granted autonomy in 1955 and full independence in 1959. And then, the Singaporean government proposed to create a new country, one comprising of all the British colonies in Southeast Asia, which they called the Federation of Malaysia. This new country would include Singapore, Malaya, Brunei, North Borneo, and Sarawak. At first they tried to convince Malaya, who quickly agreed. That was one down and three to go. Next were Arawak and North Borneo. 
They were very poor and had almost no native political parties to organize any form of independence. The British began the process of decolonization in 1951 by slowly giving the native population political power until they could rule themselves. By the 1960s, the people were largely in favor of joining Malaysia. The new leadership in North Borneo created a list of terms for them to join Malaysia, several of which made it into the Malaysian constitution. The last colony they wanted to join was Brunei. Its sultan at first supported the proposal. However, the idea was very unpopular with his own people, and when he realized it would reduce his oil profits, he also refused to join. As a result, it did not join Malaysia. It instead negotiated its own independence, and on January 1st, 1984, the country of Brunei gained its independence. Malaysia was created on September 16th, 1963, upon which the colonies of North Borneo and Sarawak gained their independence as part of the Malaysia Federation. The last of the British colonies in East Asia was Hong Kong. The British took control of Hong Kong in 1842 and had expanded the territory in 1898 with a 99-year lease. In 1997, this lease came to an end and China wanted the land back. And so, on July 1st, 1997, Hong Kong became part of China once again after years of negotiations. A rather unique colony was Papua New Guinea. It used to be two different colonies. One ruled by the British, called Papua, and the other ruled by Germany, called New Guinea. However, while the British wanted to own this territory, they didn't want to rule it. And so, in 1908, they handed over administration to Australia. After World War I, the German part was occupied by Australia as well. In 1949, these two regions were combined into one. But because these regions had different forms of government due to being originally colonized by two different countries, it meant that forming an independent government was very complicated. Because who was going to rule this territory? Would it be two separate countries? Would they be equals? Would it be possible for one of the regions to become dominant and rule over the other? And so, in 1949, this part of the world was put under a United Nations trusteeship, where the colony would gradually move towards independence as a functional government was established. In 1951, a legislative council was created. Then, a judicial system followed by public services, local governments, etc. In essence, this region of the world needed to have an entire government built from the ground up. The first elections took place in 1964, and finally, in 1972, the territory changed its name to Papua New Guinea, elected a national government, and on October 10, 1975, the country of Papua New Guinea was created. But there are also parts of Asia which were never decolonized. A prominent example of this is Russia. While Russians often like to pride themselves on the idea that, unlike the rest of Europe, they don't have a colonial history, simply looking at Northern Asia shows that this is simply incorrect. But why didn't Russia see the same desire for independence like other colonizing countries? Well, this is because of the way Russia did their colonization. Whereas most European empires saw their colonialism as a means to civilize uncivilized people, the Russians assimilated other cultures into their own. We are not Englishmen who in India strive to by no means mingle with the native races. Our strength by contrast up until now has consisted in that we assimilated the defeated peoples, blending with them peacefully. And today, you will find many ethnic groups within Russia who practice different cultures, yet they all feel Russian. For most people, the national identity is more important than their local identity. Their own cultures have blended in with the main Russian culture until they all mostly feel Russian, practicing some traditions of other cultures, but mostly being part of the Russian culture. As a result, the regions which were colonized didn't see major independence movements like most other colonies. And so the underlying struggle for independence 
was simply never able to take root like it had in the colonies of so many other countries throughout history. At least, not in Russia itself. For a history on how the Soviet Union broke apart and in essence decolonized various parts of Central Asia and Eastern Europe, I recommend you watch my video on the breakup of the Soviet Union. Next up is Portugal. It was ruled by a dictatorship until 1974. It had fought a costly war of independence in northern Angola, one of their African colonies, since 1961. When Portugal became a republic, the new government wasn't interested in maintaining an empire anymore and decided to give their colonies independence. It decided it wanted to hand over Macau, located near China, to the Chinese government. However, China refused due to political forces in its own country. In 1987, however, China and Portugal finally agreed to lay out terms to hand over the city, and on December 20th, 1999, Macau became Chinese territory once more. On the 28th of January 1975, the colony of East Timor declared its independence. A small portion of the government was made up of Marxists, and the Indonesian government used this as a pretext to invade the country a month later to make it their own colony and extract its resources with the help of varying Western countries. Out of the 750,000 people that lived there before the Indonesians invaded, about 250,000 died due to starvation, war and massacres. One third of their population was eradicated. Most of the world didn't care about it at the time, being too concerned with the Cold War. But this changed in 1991, with the Dili Massacre, when sympathy movements sprung up in Australia, Portugal and the USA. Over the next decade, the Timorese tried to get the attention of people across the world with protests. And over time, more and more countries would reduce their involvement with Indonesia because of this. Eventually, it became too costly for the Indonesian government to hold on to their colony and on May 20th, 2002, it became the country of Timor-Leste. And lastly is the USA, which held the colony of the Philippines. They conquered it from Spain in the Spanish-American War. At first the Philippines were to be peacefully assimilated into the USA in a similar manner to Hawaii or Puerto Rico. However, in 1899 a war had broken out between the US troops and the native Filipinos. And the US sent a delegation to investigate the conditions on the island and concluded that even if the USA wanted to grant independence, the Filipinos are wholly unprepared for independence, there being no Philippine nation, but only a collection of different peoples. And so, a civil government was established in 1901 based on the US system. And teachers would be sent to create a class of Filipinos capable of managing a government. In 1907, the first elections took place, and in 1919, the Philippines sent a delegation to the USA to officially request independence, while maintaining close economic and military ties with the USA. Several such missions would be sent over the next few years, until finally, in 1934, it was decided that the Philippines were to be granted independence, and while they were occupied by Japan during World War II, after the war, the Philippines became an independent nation in 1946, being one of the more peaceful transitions from colony to independence. And this is how East Asia decolonized. If you like this video, then please give it a like, subscribe and press the notification bell. The next video will be about the rise and fall and rise again of Japan. This was Avery from History Scope. Thank you for watching.